portion of God's word, if you will, turn to Genesis chapter 18 tonight. Genesis chapter 18. Uh, you could entitle the message tonight, God of Blessing and God of Judgment, or God of Blessing and Judgment. Here in the first half of this text, this whole first half of the chapter, you'll see that, that God is a God of blessing, but also in the second portion, you'll see that he is also a God of judgment. Much to learn about the Lord tonight. Much to also learn from Abraham's example what our response before the Lord should be as well. Um, if you will, before we get into reading the text, let's bow together in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Thank you so much for this great opportunity. Thank you for our church family that we are able to gather one with another, uh, singing praises to you of which you are uh, deserving and also opening your holy word um, together tonight. Uh, the one that has the word that has power to save a lost soul and power to transform each and every one of us as believers from the inside out. And we pray that that would be done tonight, that we would have a better glimpse of who you are and a better glimpse of who we are before you and what our lives should look like before you. We uh, pray that, again, your will would be done. We pray that you would be with me as I preach your word and just use me as a vessel, a, a mouthpiece to share your word, but with all of us as we receive it and as your Holy Spirit works and convicts. And it's in your son's precious name we do pray. Amen. If you will, again, um, Genesis chapter 18, uh, what we're going to do is just read a small passage at a time. Since it's a whole chapter tonight, we'll read a small passage at a time, uh, unfold what's going on there, uh, get all we can from that, and move on to the next section. If you will, we'll read verses 1 through 8 first. Uh, but as we read 1 through 8, if you will, um, a lot's going on here. Abraham's going to have three visitors come through his, his portion of land, and he's going to show uh, hospitality. He's going to do a lot of other things before them, but it turns out that the three that are here, two would be angels, and one would actually be the Lord. Again, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ uh, will be coming uh, on Abraham's land, uh, and he purposed to come by here, but also we're going to see in a minute he's purposing also to go investigate and deliver judgment in Sodom and Gomorrah as well. Uh, but a lot to be learned here, but remember that's who uh, is here. And before we get into this text, we really need to pay attention what Abraham's response before the Lord is. Um, how he humbles himself, how he um, shows hospitality, how he serves specifically. But know that this is interesting. Abraham is some 99 years old at this point and still see his heart and his actions before the Lord. Know this also, um, Abraham is um, a great man amongst the men of his day. He is a very influential man, a man. He will also be referred to in Genesis as a, a mighty prince. That's the way the other people view him. He is also, we've already seen some chapters back, that he has also had seen such prosperity that he has 318 soldiers, uh, trained men of war, at his disposal. We'd also seen that he has went and forth and conquered kings, to bring back his family and those who were, um, who were kidnapped. And, and he does this and was able to accomplish this. Guess, guess what, though? Despite all of that God has grown Abraham in and the, the statue uh, that he is at, Abraham, in his life right now, yet Abraham knew fully who he was standing before. He did not have an inflated view of himself, one before the Lord, but also before fellow man. Um, so again, much to be learned here. It doesn't matter what success or, or what you might find in your life. Let us not be lifted up in pride and get an unbalanced view of self. We won't fall before the Lord as we should and view him as we should and then serve him as we should if we have that inflated view. 
but we also won't, again, we're, we're called to serve the Lord, but we're also called to serve um, the, the, uh, even the lowest of, of all men, if you will even serve the least of these. We're, we're called to serve fellow man and to love and to help. And my friend, if we have a wrong inflated view of self, we won't do that. What we do unto the least of these, we do unto the Lord. Amen. But again, let us look now, verses 1 through 8, and see what we can learn here. It says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. And said, My Lord, if, if, um, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away or don't depart, I pray thee from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts after that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened unto the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal kneaded and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto the young man and he hasted to dress it and he took butter and milk and the calf which had um, dr uh, which he had dressed and set it before them and he stood by them under the tree and they did eat again just see the magnitude of what's going on here again where um, Abram, Abraham is settled at this point is in the plains of Mamre. Um, he has his tent here and he is at the door, at the flap of the tent and he looks out and he sees three, past three people passing through and he calls out to them and uh, he, he asks them to come and let him show them hospitality. Again, know this, that in his culture, hospitality was a big deal. We even see throughout text, hospitality is a big deal. We even see that God still calls us to show hospitality. Again, hospitality is a opening up of your home, opening up of your resources to help those who are in need. Um, again, you, you see this there, that when people went and traveling a long ways, um, they would just come through some, by someone's land, and if the person was showing hospitality, they'll take them in and take care of them. They would feed them. They would give them drink. They would give them rest. Sometimes they would even um, give them board to stay and to get rest. But again, hospitality is uh, something that believers were, were charged to do. We even see in the New Testament um, when a believer showed great hospitality to God's men, uh, to God's people who were preaching the word, that they were commended for this. They were commended for their support um, of these men. So again, we see that happening right here. But know this, it's uh, we're, we realize here that these are indeed two angels accompanying the Lord himself. Again, get this, this is the Lord he is referred to. This is the Lord, this is Yahweh, pre-incarnate Christ, this is Adonai. He is, get this, and this is the way we should view, this is the way we should view the Lord. God is master. He is sovereign over our lives. Again, when we call Jesus Lord, when we call him Savior, we, know, we recognize him as the one who has saved us, who has humbled himself um, as a servant to save our souls. And when we call him Lord, we are recognizing he's master. He is sovereign over our lives. And there's a need to give him lordship in our lives. To say, not my will be done, but your will be done. But I love this of all that's happening here. Again, he falls down. See the humility already. He falls down on his face. He falls before them. 
He falls before the Lord. He's showing humility, you already see. Uh, Get this, and what does he ask them? He actually says, um, look, allow me. I love that. It's the attitude of allow me, please let me serve you. Again, we even were looking at service this morning of when you even have opportunity to do good, especially do good unto um, fellow believers in the household of faith to do it, right? But get this, even here, he's begging for the opportunity, let me serve you, amen? What an attitude to have. One, especially before the Lord, what an attitude to have. Lord, I pray you, let me serve you. Let me do good for you. And then also, as we see, he, he, one way that we serve the Lord, one way that we do good unto the Lord is we do good unto each other. Amen. We serve, we help, we love uh, one another. What also did it says, I, I pray you, let me do this. Let me go fetch you water. Let me go be your servant and go fetch you water that your, your feet may be washed and that you may rest yourself under this tree. So again, sit back, recline, rest in, in the cool under the tree. Let me go get you water to show you great hospitality and to cleanse your feet. And it says, and also verse five, it says, and I, and I will fetch you a morsel of bread. I'll go prepare you bread. And he also says, and comfort ye your hearts after that ye shall pass on. And for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, so do as, that, as thou hast said. Again, they, they say, go, go do that, that you desire to do. But I love this verse six. It says that he hastened. Can you imagine this? Not only is he a, a simply a man in his culture, that is showing haste, that's already humility, but he is 99 years old and he puts pep in his step in essence. He shows haste to get back to the tent and prepare this great hospitality and service for the Lord. It says, and uh, and he went into the tent unto Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal needed and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abram ran into the herd and fetched a calf. So again, he's, he's having now this bread being prepared by his wife. He's also going out now. Um, he ran, it says. He ran, he ran to his herd and it says he fetched a calf tender and good. I'll just tell you here, this is a lesson to learn as well. One, he's showing haste in this, this serving. But also, he's choosing the best. Amen. He is getting a calf that's tender and good. He's not getting the unhealthy calf that he was hoping one day would die and he wouldn't have to bother with it. He's not getting the worst that he had, the least tender that he has. No, a calf tender and good. My friend, you and I, that's what the Lord deserves. Amen? Too often we sometimes get in the rut of of only giving God the minimum of only giving God our leftovers, right? Um, Of only giving God that which does not cost us much to anything. But we're talking about the Lord, amen? We're talking about Creator. We're talking about God. We're talking about our Savior. We're talking about, think of this, we should serve Him, but He's the greatest servant, amen? He humbled Himself to serve fellow man, He even um, is uh, pleading for us day and night, even now. He even gave his life on our behalf, amen? And the list goes on. So my friend, if anyone's deserving of our service and our best, it's him, amen? I even think of this, even uh, David would have this amazing philosophy. David would have this philosophy, look, that Um, that he would not give unto the Lord that which cost him nothing, right? That look, if, if he had the ability to give something to the Lord, if it didn't cost him anything, if it didn't require sacrifice, if he didn't in essence feel it or feel the loss in essence of what he was giving, then he wouldn't do it. And my friend, what, what an example to you and me. Uh, My friend, the Lord is deserving of our very best. 
And he does this again. He ran to do it. He does this in haste. He gets it dressed. He gets it prepared. Verse 8, it says, And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. I, I love this. My friend, he, he tells them, kick back. Let me serve you. He actually said, please let me serve you, right? And he goes and prepares this meal. Get this. We already know that his, his household is growing. He is, he is a very prosperous man. God has blessed him. Again, he has already has um, hundreds of, of military men at his disposal. No telling how many servants he could have said, here, I want you to go do this, get this done, right? But yet, his humility and desire to serve, he does it even himself and allows his wife to even be part of that uh, love and that service. And again, a lesson of he, he doesn't in haste, even at the age of 99, but also he sets this before him, them, and what, is, what does it say he did? He says, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. That's a, a fascinating picture. Again, he didn't just sit down and join them and, 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 and eat with them. He could have, I suppose. But that is the heart of, uh, that's the heart of service. He sits it down before them and, and, and meets their need and watches them eat, right? He doesn't, in essence, serve himself. He serves others first. He considers others before himself. He looks at the needs of others even before himself. So my friend, I'll just tell you, in these 99 years of, of in some less than that of, of growing with the Lord, he has definitely grown in love and humility, amen? He has definitely grown in having a servant heart um, even before the Lord. And I, I, I challenge us all, myself included, will we have that same heart? Again, before the Lord, there is no one more worthy than him. Will we give him the best? Would we give him our all and will we do it in haste? Will we joyfully do it? Will we say, please let me do it? Please give me opportunity to do it? And then also, my friend, will we do it unto the least of these? And so doing unto the least of these, you do it unto the Lord. If you will, let's look at verse 9, starting in the next portion of the text. It says here, it says, And they said unto him, again, they're sitting under the tree, standing by, watching them eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah? thy wife. And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. And Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So again, it's just emphasizing again that uh, right now he's 99 years old. Right now his wife's 89 years old. It says even with her, um, her um, having the um, manner of, of producing children as a woman, it's past that time. She's past that age. But again, what does, what does the Lord say to her? Look, um, she's going to... Uh, produce that child that was promised. Amen? At the appropriate time, she will be the one to produce that child. And then it said, it's just emphasizing again, even, even though she's um, past the time, but verse 12 says this, therefore Sarah laughed. Again, in essence, the, 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 the tent, uh, the, the flap to the tent, the door to the tent, she hears through it what they're saying. She hears the Lord saying this, that again, um, that, that, that the time is coming up where she's going to have the child, right? And she hears it, and it said that she did what? Again, 12, and it says, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? 
Is anything too difficult? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And she said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Excuse me, and he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Again, Paul's here for a minute. What's happened? Again, she, she overhears this great comment. And it's a great comment. Again, the Lord purposed to come through here. He purposed to remind Abraham, look, your child's coming. Your child that you have waited some 25 years for, that child is coming, amen? And what an amazing reminder of that promise. And again, she hears it, she overhears it. In the previous chapters, we see actually that, that um, in essence, uh, he would actually, Abraham would actually make a similar comment, right? Um, he, he, he laughs almost in a, in a sense that he's wondering, how can this great thing be, right? But the amazing thing is God doesn't rebuke him. It, it shows us that likely God is seeing to the heart of him. He's seeing that he didn't do it out of unbelief. He is seeing that he is doing it out of joy and excitement. God, you're going to do this. Amen. I know it is impossible for me. I know that I'm past the years, but I know that you're going to do it. Amen. You said it and I know you're going to do it. But in, in, a, in a sense, she does something similar, but it says she laughs within herself. It's likely showing here she laughs out of unbelief. She doesn't believe it at this moment. Maybe she believed it before, she doubted, or maybe she's always doubted under this point. But, but it's interesting. She's in the tent. She laughs within herself. And what does the Lord say? Again, the Lord, get this, who knows our thoughts. You will see Jesus do this many times, amen. When he is here and he is in his earthly ministry, he would answer the thoughts of men. They would think something uh, or have a, a bad attitude or have a wrong heart or whatever it may be or have doubt, and he would answer their thought. Again, that's the Lord. Amen. Know that. Be reminded of that today. The Lord, God Almighty, um, Adonai, he sees our very thoughts even tonight. He sees our very thoughts even tomorrow and each and every day. He sees our thoughts, but it's interesting. He answers her and he says this. He says, um, is there anything too hard for the Lord? And that's a key phrase that we must um, ha have in mind tonight. When the Lord says, is there anything too hard for the Lord? We should even in our hearts um, make it a declarative statement that there is nothing too hard for the Lord. Amen. Remember those, those verses of uh, what is impossible for man is possible for God. Amen. And let us take encouragement and make it a declarative statement. Even in the midst of us waiting, they're, they're waiting 25 years for a promise to be fulfilled. We're, we may wait a long time for things in our life. We may wait a long time before we see the Lord even face to face, but no, it's going to happen. He said it and it's a done deal. He keeps his promises. But again, it actually says that she denies it, right? That he confronts her, he says it to her, and she denies it. She, says, she said, I, I didn't do it. The interesting thing for us to take note of this, what application can we have from this? If God makes known to us, maybe even through a, a preaching, teaching time, we're hearing God's word, maybe we're studying God's word on our own at home, whatever it may be, and God makes known to us, our thinking might be wrong. Our attitude might be wrong. Our words or our actions might be wrong. What, what we sometimes don't do, let us do this though instead, is that let us say, Lord, you nailed it. You see, you have, and this is what we should do with God. This is what we should allow him to do with his word and his Holy Spirit. We should allow him to search us out, amen? Search us out. If there is any evil thing in me, show me, and then teach me the right way to go, amen? 
My friend, would you and I, would we re- renew that attitude tonight? Again, maybe it's even a, in essence she gets caught in having the wrong thought. Well, would we, would we not deny? And, and this is the interesting thing. There's no need line to God, amen? That's vanity. It's vanity to try lying to God because, again, God knows, amen? God even knows our thoughts. No one else does know our thoughts, but God knows our thoughts. So again, it's vanity to try to lie about it. It's vanity to try to justify it. No, God, I, I didn't really mean that. No, it, it's, it's vanity to try to deny it. But would we confess, Lord, you're right. I did do that. I did do that. That was wrong. I know what is right. I repent of that. Please help me now. Please help me go in the direction that you would have me to go. This is key um, for us um, to have this attitude as well. I'm just going to read a couple things about Abraham. Uh, We saw Abraham doing a similar uh, action to a a statement about that promised son. We we see Sarah doing a similar uh, statement about that promise of the son. But uh, the New Testament will actually bring to light even a little bit more. We've we already seen a little bit from Abraham. I'm going to reread just a couple verses. It said, Romans 4.20, it says, He staggered not. He staggered not or wavered not or doubted not at the promise of God um, through unbelief. So Abraham, he, he didn't have unbelief with, with this. It says, but was strong in faith giving glory to God and get this being and being fully persuaded that um that uh, what he had promised he was able also to perform it so that's Abraham that's what God reveals to us about Abraham that Abraham didn't doubt he didn't waver he was fully persuaded look that when God speaks I can trust it When God makes a promise, I can trust it. Even if I don't understand how it's going to happen, even if I think with man it's impossible, no, if God says it, we need to have be fully persuaded, God, you are true. You're true to your promises, and we're talking about God here. Amen? If any times we want to doubt that God will keep his promise or do the amazing things that he says, he will do. We're studying in Genesis. Go back to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen. That should clear up all doubt. Amen. We think things, again, we look at life and we look at problems through our eyes and think, well, man, I can't do it. Well, man, with man, it's impossible. This is hopeless. But remember who we stand before. Amen. We stand before God. The same God that created the heavens and the earth. Infinite power. Amen. And as this says, we need to make that declarative statement. There is nothing too hard for him. Amen. Nothing too hard for him. If anything, let us be reminded of that tonight. Just one more verse of scripture to see a little bit about Sarah as well. Uh, It says Hebrews 11 and 11. It says, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. It's interesting because we see see the Lord correcting her here. Very likely she is laughing out of unbelief at this moment. And it's some one year later when she's going to have the child. Very, very possible that God, the Lord, is correcting her for something that is needed. He's correcting her and he's he's challenging her. Is there really anything too hard for the Lord? And it's very likely, my friend, again, even though she denied it at this point, very likely it seems that by looking at Hebrews, it's very likely that she takes that to heart she searches out herself and, and realizes, okay, this was unbelief, but I believe you, God. Amen? It is very likely that she established that in her heart and that she, she judged him faithful who had promised. And then she has that promised child. I love the way God works. God is good. Amen? So again, much to be learned even in this text here. Now it's switching gears a little bit to 16. 
We see in the first portion, we see that God is a God of blessing. I'll just tell you, Abraham, Sarah, they didn't deserve these great things that God was doing. Us today, we don't deserve any of the good things that God does in our life, amen? But yet he does it. Yet he blesses us, and who are we that he would do it? So I love that. We see the first portion, his blessing, his goodness, but then we even see his goodness and his uh, being God and holy now in his judgment. We're going to see it in verse 16 and on. It says here, And the men rose up from thence, and it says, And they looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. He goes with them to send them out on the way. So I love this. After this amazing reminder of promise and very likely strengthening the faith of Sarah, we see that they stand up and they turn their face towards Sodom. And as he, he walks with them to see them off the land and to, to, to see them off on the way, it says, verse 17, it says, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Should I keep this from Abraham, what I'm about to do? It says, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. I love this. Every time we see that, that Abraham will be great, he will be mighty, he will be blessed. And guess what it even says? And all nations of the earth will be blessed in him. We're going to look at that one more time before we, we conclude later. But again, that is referencing the Messiah. My friend, God was so good to Abraham and to all of Israel. He was so good to them. He blessed them, right? But the most amazing thing that he did was that he would bring the promised Messiah into the world through them. Amen? Amen. That is how all nations of the earth would be blessed by Abraham, right? It was because Jesus was going to come through Abraham and through Israel. And that was that amazing thing that God's saying is like, he's, he's, he's saying that is, is that, look, um, I'm going to be, bring blessing. I'm going to bring the Messiah through Abraham. Uh, and he's saying, I, I will make this known unto him what I'm doing now. So he's even referencing that as, I'm a God who is showing a blessing to Abraham and letting him know that about me. But what I'm also about to do is what he's about to do, he's going to make known his character of judgment as well. And that's the truth. My friend, something that we've got to know about God and that the world don't want to see about God is, yes, God is loving. He's perfectly loving. Amen. He is perfectly good. He pours out blessing on, on all of us who don't deserve it, but he is also perfectly just. He would not be a good, loving God if he wasn't just, amen? If he didn't punish sin. And we'll, re, we'll end with that later as well. But now what does he say? Verse 19, he says, For I know him, I love this, verse 19, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring up Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Verse 18, very interesting. It's showing that, that Abraham would be influential with the whole world, okay? Abraham and his lineage, and especially Christ coming through his lineage, that they would have influence and give blessing to the whole world. But 19, it turns inward, and he says this, I know Abraham. It says he is also going to be influential with his own family, amen? And that's deep, and that's good. So with us as well, would we not only be a blessing to other people, would we not only make known to them the, the Messiah to other people in the world, what we also must do as 19, we must do this. We, we must do this that we would command our children and our household after, after us, amen? That they shall keep the way of the Lord. That's something that we are held 
responsible to first, amen? As men in our households, as spiritual leaders, that we are responsible for teaching our children the way of the Lord. That as a household, we serve the Lord. As a household, we love the Lord. We, we, we corporately come together to worship the Lord. We, we live out the truth at home and in, in, in church, in the community, all of this, amen. And it said that he would be influential even to his children after him. Of that legacy of you teach your kids and, you, and that carries on even into your grandkids and your great-grandchildren. My friend, this is something that we must pray for this is something that we must be focused on if we want the generations to come to love and adore and follow the lord we've got to teach them amen we've got to teach them at home and 19 brings that home and it says i love that he says he knows he will do it would he be a perfect man no but would his life be marked as loving adoring and seeking to follow the lord of growing in faith. Verse 20. It said, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. Pause here for just a moment. Now he makes known unto Abraham what he's going to do now. Again, they're already turning, pointing towards um, Sodom. They're on their way there, and he's telling him, I'm going to, and as he said, he said for these two things to happen, that, and that's interesting that we find out about God. It says that, that um, because the cry against or of Sodom and Gomorrah um, has, uh, ha has come to him. Again, this is interesting that likely many people um, have been crying out against the, the evil, the atrocities, the hatred, the sinfulness that's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah, and they're crying out in prayer, God help us, right? As they're being wronged, as they're being abused by those in Sodom and Gomorrah, likely, and, and later, it, it's sad. We're going to see that when, when the two angels get there, the men of the city try to, to rape them. This is showing us the, the abomination, the sin that's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And again, he's, he's telling, look, since that cry has come to me, my friend, God is a God who hears the cries and prayers. Amen. So that happens and it said, and because their sin is very grievous, look, there's people crying out, Lord, help. And it is very evident that their sin is grievous. Amen. He says, because that, I'm come to, he says, I'm going to go there and I'm going to search it out myself. It's interesting. Something that we look at scripture and we know about God is God's all knowing. Amen. We even see, he even sees the thoughts of Abraham. He's all knowing, my friend. There's nothing that gets done that he does not see. Amen. That's why he's perfect judge. He knows all that goes on. But I love this. It's interesting. He's showing us his, um, the fact that he is not hasty. He's even for our benefit showing that, look, he's coming and he's personally checking it out, right, before he brings judgment. And this is interesting, though, uh, uh, and we're going to get to more of this in a minute. He's going to clearly be perfect in all his judgment. Now, if you will, verse 22 so he tells him that. He tells him what's going to, going to happen. That they're going to investigate. Verse 22, it says, And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But, uh, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. So the two angels, they actually go towards Sodom. And they're going to go investigate this. And at this moment, um, the Lord stays standing there with Abraham and he's going to talk with him. Verse 23, it says, and Abraham drew near. He draws near to him. And it says, and he said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Per adventure, get this, he's now going to uh, petition with the Lord, try to plead with the Lord, but he said this, 
Will you also destroy the righteous along with the wicked? And what do we know? And we're going to see in the next chapter, Lot, his nephew, lives there in Sodom. He lives there with his family. And so he is having care. Are you going to destroy also the righteous along with the wicked? And then it says this. um, He says, um, peradventure there be 50 righteous men within the city wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the for the 50 righteous that are therein he says look if there's if you find 50 righteous there would would you spare them verse 25 would you spare the whole place for their sake it says 25 it says that be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee shall not the judge of all the earth do right he's actually saying look i know it's not in your nature to do that to destroy the righteous along with the wicked. And then he ends that statement. He says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? That's another key portion in this passage. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? We're going to see what he's going to do in this whole process. But we could already know that with a declarative statement. He's going to do right in all his judgment. Amen. He always has. And he always will. He is perfect judge. He's perfect judge and he's also rightful judge. Verse 26, it says, And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. I love that. He's... So he already asked, look, if if there's 50, will you spare them? And and the Lord says, yes, I will. I'll do that. But then he says, look, me being dust and ashes before you, again, humility. I'm simply created man before my creator. I'm simply sinful man before perfect God. But he says, can I ask you one more thing? He says, 28, he says, peradventure, there shall be, uh, there shall lack Five of the 50 righteous, wilt thou spare all the city for a lack of five? And he said, I, if I find there 40 and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again and said, peradventure there shall be 40 found there. And he said, I will not do it for 40's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. Don't get angry with me, please. He said, I, and I will speak. Peradventure there shall um, 30 be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, behold now, I have taken it upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be 20 found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 20's sake. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak but this once. I'll say this one last thing. I'll ask for this one last thing. Peradventure 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the 10's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham and Abraham returned unto his place. Again, fascinating Uh, thing that is going on here again he starts with 50 he's trying to petition with the Lord again he says I I, I know you wouldn't destroy the righteous along with the wicked I know that you are a a judge who does right in his judgments but he said look I petition you if you find 50 there um, righteous people there would you spare it all and again I love that he God the Lord kept agreeing "I'll, I'll do that but then I think as Abraham thought about it a little bit more and he, he knew the situation that it was with Sodom and Gomorrah, he knew that it was a sin-filled city lacking in righteous men. He kept dwindling down the number, right? He did it all the way until he gets to 10. And he says, look, if there's just 10 there, there's just 10 righteous there, would you spare them? I, I think it's interesting. He, he possibly was hoping that Lot was righteous, that he was indeed a true believer. 
And he's possibly thinking that, um, that maybe even within his family, in his household, it might have barely come to 10. But interestingly enough, we see that the Lord, he agreed, I, I won't do it for that. There's 10 there, I, I, I'll spare them. And then later next week, we're going to see 19 and see a little bit more. But I'll just readdress that question. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And again, in the first section where we see that God is a God of blessing, you might ask sometimes, is there, is there anything that's too difficult for the Lord? But again, may we be encouraged, no, there's nothing too difficult for the Lord. He is good and he has all resources and he can do whatever he sets his purposes to do. But also in this section of judgment, um, you might ask that question, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? There are people that look at the word of God today and they see the judgment that takes place in scripture and they'll say in their own wisdom, they think that God's not just in his judgment. But let me tell you, no one is more just than God in his judgment. Amen. Even think about this for just a moment. I'll share just a few verses of scripture with you. Even uh, Job 8, 3, one of his, one of Job's friends actually makes the statement. He says, doth God pervert judgment or doth the almighty pervert justice? And the answer is no. Amen. The answer is God's judgment are perfect. Deuteronomy actually 32 and 4 says this. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Amen? That's the God we serve. He, everything he does is perfect. All of his judgments are perfect. He's the God of truth. He is without iniquity. He is just and he is right. Amen? Think about this just for a minute when it comes to judgment. We've talked a little bit in, in the past through some of these studies. When it comes to judgment, think of this for a moment. One, he's rightful judge. Amen? We have judges of the land, and I'm glad we have them. And we're better off the more they fall in line with, with the word of God. Amen? But again, what would our land be without good judges? But I'll ask you, what would our world be without our perfect judge, God. Amen? He's rightful judge. Think about this. He has created us. Man, again, may, may accuse God and think he's not fair in, in his judgments. But I'll just tell you, my friend, God is creator. We exist because of him. The very breath in our lungs belongs to him. Amen? Our life's not our own. Amen? And man wants to have this attitude that um, they, again, can just do life however they want. But again, we stand before our God, and he is rightful judge. He has created us, but he has also created us with purpose. And he has also given us a standard to live by, amen? And the truth is, again, man may make those statements today that he's not right, that he's not fair, but the truth is we're all going to die and we're all going to be judged. And when we are all judged, no one's going to stand before him with excuse. Amen. Very interestingly, the God who shows here that he knows our very thoughts, we're going to stand open and exposed before him. Amen. In judgment. Again, God will make known every thought, every action, every word, all of it. And man's not going to say, you're not right and you're not just. No, they're going to stand humbly before God, humbly before judge. Not only is he rightful judge, but again, he is perfect judge. Again, only a God who knows even the thoughts of man. Only a God who is all-knowing. Only a God who has perfect standard and judges by perfect standard could be perfect judge and he is if you will i even share with you ezekiel we're talking about they're headed towards sodom ezekiel 16 49 and 50 here's what god knew 
It says here, it says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and there was haughty, they, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Again, that's the truth. God sees this city. He sees, again, he's hearing the cries of all those crying out for, for God to intervene, for judgment, for help. He also um, sees their sin and he lists it here. Pride, arrogance. Arrogance before God, rejection of God, and, 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 uh, and, and it's sad when we, we look at a country that's increasing in these same sins he's list, listing here. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an eye-opener. But again, is there pride? Is there arrogance? Is there fullness of, of bread? This is abundance. And here in America, we see sadly pride and arrogance before God increasing. We see us living in a time of abundance. God's blessed us, and mankind sadly um, turned that around to, to being lifted in pride, thinking he's done it himself, that man's done it himself, and he thinks he don't need God. It also says an abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Again, there's pride, rejected God. There's abundance. They had the resources, but it said they actually were idle to help anyone in need. It says they, they, they refused to help those who were poor and needy. It says they were haughty, and it says they committed abomination before me. Again, we look at text. shows us a lot of things about God, even in the nature of him being perfect judge. We see that God judges individuals, and he perfectly does. We see that God judges churches, cities, nations, mankind as a whole. But here's the truth. Uh, I love this with, with text. When we actually look at it and study it out, God is long-suffering, amen? He is patient, very patient. Again, with some of these cities, uh, with some of these uh, places, with, with, uh, with people, settlements of people, he's waiting hundreds of years. He is giving fair warning. He is giving warning, repent or be judged. And I'll just tell you, people complain about that they think God's judgment isn't fair. The interesting thing is, is we're not entitled to that. And I love it that we see that God is a God of blessing we're not entitled to blessing. We don't deserve it. We also don't deserve the long-suffering of God, amen? If we really want to boil it down and we see truth, we actually deserve full judgment. We don't deserve mercy. But by God's grace and by God's mercy, he is a good God who offers it. So in this text that we've seen tonight, be reminded of this. Judgment's coming. It is judgment's going to be fully meted out by a perfect judge. But the amazing thing, although we see the, the fact of God's judgment here, be reminded of, though, God's blessing. Be reminded, as, as he told Abraham, there, the nations of the world's going to be blessed through you. Be reminded of that tonight. God's a God of judgment, but through Abraham, he would bring the Messiah. Amen. And I love that, that Jesus would go to the cross. He would take my sin and your sin, the sin of the world upon himself. And my friend, judgment would be perfectly, and, and, and wrath would be perfectly poured out on him, on Jesus. Right? That's what makes God even, even just in that, is that Jesus took the punishment that you and I deserve. And if we don't want to remain in condemnation and be judged for our own sin and go to hell of which we deserve, then, then repent of sin and trust Christ. There's no other way to have life but through Him. Amen? There's no other way to be saved from separation from God and saved from eternal hell than, uh, than trusting in Jesus. So I love this. You see a 
a, a full, perfect picture of, again, not only the judgment of God, but the grace of God and the blessing of God. But my friend, may we tonight not question whether he's just because he is. But my friend, may we humble ourselves and throw ourselves on his mercy that he's offering. Amen. And may we be used by people again, just as Abraham was. Teach your people to love and serve the Lord. Teach, teach again the nation, people, people around you to love and serve the Lord. As we conclude our service